some people aren't going to like you. I remember thinking, like, yeah, I'm definitely not going to stand up in front of an audience and be like, I command you to whatever. Oh, well, you had to be there. No, I didn't, because that's why we invented stories. So I, in fact, didn't got to be there. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of Rhetorically Speaking and or May It Displease the Court, depending on where you're listening. Today is our very first crossover episode. I'm Mary, the main host of May It Displease the Court. I'm an attorney, appellate attorney mainly. I've done a lot of uh, public defense work, so mainly for, I mainly represent very poor people. Yeah, Mary's doing God's work, as they say. And I, everyone, am Lee Pierce. I am the secondary host of May It Displease the Court. And what's our slogan for that? It's um, court system has always been a nightmare, but especially so in the era of dark money. I am the primary host of Rhetorically Speaking, of course, a podcast committed to banishing banality one speech at a time. And today we are teaming up our rhetorical, legal, intersex, Taiwanese, Japanese genius brains to address an issue on everyone's mind right now. Right. Free speech versus hate speech. What's the difference? Where does hate crime fit in? How do we get social justice if hate speech isn't recognized? And overall, just like, what are we going to do about it? Yep. So here it is. All the answers and solutions you ever wanted and probably a bunch that you don't. And Mary's going to kick it off with uh, the story that I, she's told me a couple times and is absolutely perfect for this episode. So Mary, tell us tell us the Anne Frank anecdote. Okay. So Frank, I was... The Anne Frank anecdote. The Anne Frank anecdote. So I was flying back from France at the exact same time when the planes hit the Twin Towers, so back in 2001. And after U.S. airspace was closed, my plane was turned back to Amsterdam, and I got to spend an extra week in Europe in Amsterdam until I was able to get back home. So, you know, my 9-11 story is not tragic. I mean, I mean, it's tragic in the sense as just the same collective grief that everyone else was in, but I got to experience it being kind of apart from my country and my family for a brief period of time. And so after a few days of getting money sent and wired to to me, because um, I had no money, I didn't have a credit card, I'd been visiting family and, you know, left with $35 uh, cash to have dinner in Detroit uh, during my layover. So after we got some money um, and there was no hope of leaving anytime soon, uh, we decided to do a little sightseeing. I mean, what else are we going to do? And we went to the Anne Frank house. Now, I've been interested in the Holocaust since I was in elementary school and I was first exposed to the story. I read a book um, and I had read almost every book I could get my hands on about the Holocaust. I studied it extensively in college. So going to the Anne Frank house was something that was you know, really meaningful. When we got there, first you go on a tour and you're in a little tour group and we we're on a little tour group and we actually got to go into the attic where Anne and her family and another family were hiding out from the Nazis. I got to see her bedroom. They had put plexiglass in front of the pictures that she had pasted on the walls of her portion, her bedroom portion. We saw the hidden bookcase entrance, you know, where they would enter and you could see the very tiny windows where like the only light came through. And it was honestly, it was a really emotional experience because, you know, here we were stranded in another country far away from home. And, you know, it seemed really scary. You know, I was worried that another world war was going to break out and we'd be, you know, on the other side of the ocean. So after you see, you know, the area, because it's a pretty small area, they take you down into a part of the, the house, which is more like a typical museum exhibit. Um, so they have stuff on the walls with written descriptions. And then there's this table in the center where they have everybody from the tour group sit around it. And in front of each seat it are two buttons, a red button and a green button. And then on the ceiling are these two lines of lights, green lights and red lights. And there's a screen at the end. And then they show a film which shows footage, for example, of like far right Austrian politicians saying really racist and hateful things. And then the moderator asks whether we thought that that speech should be protected, hit your green button, or censored, hit the red button. So we did it. And then you see the lights on the ceiling flash and you can see, you know, the numbers basically who voted for what. And the vast majority voted for free speech. 
And then this process was repeated several more times. And each time you watched a video, the speech got more extreme. And then the, the, they would start adding comments that made it seem as if more people are supporting these hateful politicians. And, and you could see the, and then we were to vote after each portion of speech. And you could see it went from being vast majority free speech to 50-50% protect free speech. And then by the end, the vast majority was voting censorship. Yes, censorship. And, you know, I've never been a part of any type of like indoctrination like that. I could, I knew at the time, I'm like, this is propaganda. Like, I can't believe. And just to watch everybody's mind, you know, most people's mind switch. I mean, I think there was like one, two greens left. That was like me and my partner that was with me. And I was honestly pretty pissed. I was like really excited to go to this, see this. And I was like, really pissed that they were clearly pushing a very pro censorship propaganda and that it had been, and that it really worked, especially with the people in my group and kind of soured my opinion of the Anne Frank house, to be honest. Um, you know, mm. I'm an American. Uh, I was in law school at the time. So first amendment, freedom of speech, you know, that had been drummed into my head. I just taken con law. I just studied the topic. So I was like, as most, gung-ho as I probably was ever going to be in free speech, you know, valuing that over censorship. Now, of course, you have to remember this was in 2001. Fox News was five years old and it had just started to ruin uh, my former mother-in-law's mind. Um, mm -hmm. Charles Koch and his brother were still toiling away in secret, trying to remake the way Americans think. So we didn't really know the damage that regular hate speech can do on a population the way we do now. And I did understand, even at the time, where the museum was coming from. Like, some ideas aren't just offensive, they're dangerous. You know, and what are we going to do with those ideas? Mm -hmm. And censorship is definitely a tactic. Right. It's an option. <laughs> right. It's an option. Yeah. And fun fact for those of you that don't know, Mary's former mother-in-law is my grandmother. So, Mary, I'm listening to all this and I, I'm, I'm totally following, right, because this is a, you and I share kind of similar approaches to this issue. But I do real quick before we even get into like hate, like censorship versus hate speech and stuff. Can you like clarify for me what is a hate crime and how that's different? And then maybe we come back to hate speech because I just want to get my vocabulary clear because I'm not a, a lawyer. Right. So I know how I think about these words, but I don't know like legally really how they're defined. Okay, well, I'll give you the FBI definition of a hate crime, and it's a criminal offense, criminal offense against meaning, a, you know, something that happens to a person or property that's motivated. So it's an action, it's an action uh, okay. against a person or property that's motivated, at least in part, by an offender's bias against race, religion, disability, sexual orientation, ethnicity, gender, or gender identity. That can include their skin color or national origin. So these hate crimes, they're, they're overt acts, such as like painting a swastika on, on a, a temple or, mm -hmm. you know, depriving someone of their civil rights, something like that. Also, true threats, like real acts of intimidation or conspiracy to commit these crimes can also be a hate crime. The, the Supreme Court has upheld these laws. Um allowing the criminalization of these acts to impose a harsher punishment when it can be proven that the defendant was targeting the victim because of their race, ethnicity, beliefs, identity. Um, a hate crime isn't, it's not just offensive speech or conduct. Like it's, it's not only that it's specific criminal behavior. So vandalism, arson, assault, murder, um, and victims can be institutions could be religious organizations, could be government entities, and could also be individuals. Okay. And so then if I'm understanding you correctly, hate crime is really a thing that happens outside of the First Amendment, right? Because the First Amendment does talk about free speech, but it doesn't seem to have anything to do with what you just described. Right. If I say something hateful towards you, that's not a crime. All right. So... What does the First Amendment actually say? So the First Amendment deals with Congress, says Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech. Now, it's got, it says other things, but we're, we're, we're really focusing on the freedom of speech. So there's Congress can make no law that limits the freedom of speech. Now, 
where does hate speech, speech, hate speech, hate speech (laughs) into that? Well, the problem with hate speech is that it's completely subjective, meaning that it means different things to different people or different groups of people. It's a term that's kind of thrown around as if it has like a set definition, but it doesn't. Hate speech is not a legally defined term. So the First Amendment, it it protects the free exchange of ideas, even if the expression of those ideas is considered offensive or hateful. And in a unanimous uh, Supreme Court decision, although Gorsuch, for some reason, didn't take part in that, um, Mattel versus Tam, 2017 case, uh, they held that, that there was a fundamental principle of the First Amendment, which is that the government may not punish or suppress speech based on the disapproval of ideas or perspectives that the speech conveys. So it doesn't permit any type of discrimination based upon viewpoint. And like it or not, giving offense is a viewpoint. Mm -hmm. They also repeated this, this idea, which they've said in other Supreme Court cases, which is that the public expression of ideas may not be prohibited merely because the ideas themselves are offensive to some of the hearers. So, you know, that kind of rules out hate speech, you know, like it or not. uh, It's really something that is protected under the First Amendment. Now, when people say hate speech, what do they mean? Well, typically they use it to describe speech that's designed to demean, vilify, or incite hatred against a group or a class of people because of their race, religion, sexual or gender identity, disability, or national origin. Now, if speech that offends those groups is copacetic with the First Amendment, are there any legal limits on speech? Yes, there are legal limits on speech. Speech becomes criminal when It is a specific threat of violence or it's inciting imminent criminal activity targeted at a specific person or group, a.k.a. fighting words. So these are like face-to-face personal insults that address a specific person or of the sort that are likely to start an immediate fight. I don't know if um, that makes anybody think of January 6th, but it Hmm. could. So this exception isn't limited to racial or religious insults. It doesn't uh, cover, you know, all racially or religiously offensive statements. It's really, it's really kind of not about the content. It's about, you know, is there a specific threat? Are we going to incite imminent criminal activity? Another narrow exception are for true threats of illegal conduct or incitement intended or likely to produce imminent illegal conduct. Not something that might happen way in the future. Like, it's got to be like, let's go, storm the Capitol now. Mm. So you can threaten to kill somebody because they're black um, or because they're white um, or because they're Muslim or Christian or Jewish, and that can be made a crime, but it's not because it's hate speech. It's because it's Mm. illegal to make a threat to incite a crime against somebody for any reason. That reason could be this guy's, you know, screwing my girlfriend or girl or whatever, or he stole a bunch of money from me. Like it's, it doesn't really matter. Or it could be because, you know, he's part of a protected class. It's about the threat to, you know, commit a crime. Yeah. And so we really see the difference between hate crime and hate speech here because in crime, there's this additional category called hate crime. But in speech, that's considered not protective, like fighting words. There's no extra hate fighting words, right? So they're not quite the same. You would think that if you can add hate to a crime to make it a hate crime, you could add hate to a speech to make it hate speech. But that just isn't the way the law works. Right. You can say offensive stuff. You know, otherwise, every single word for me, every single word that a KKK person says would be hate speech. But that's not a crime. I mean, you you know, we know that that's not a crime, uh, you know, in the context of the country. So we have to extrapolate that to, you know, other scenarios. Well, and I find so a couple of years ago, maybe like two, uh, these students at a different SUNY school posted on their Snapchat. It was Halloween and they were laying in bed and they, they posted like a selfie on Snapchat. And all it said was gonna lynch some N words tonight. And I 
always thought that seemed like hate speech to me because it seems to be fighting words, but I don't think the case ever went anywhere because uh, I think one student wasn't actually a student. They were just like a boyfriend and the other student, I think, dropped out because everybody was so awful to the, you know, they like social shaming. Right. But do you think that would, so even that doesn't count threatening to lynch a black person. I mean, that seems to be like a, not like a totally obvious one to me, but I, I don't think, think that it is. you could, I think that you could say they did go out and actually do that. I think you could go to their social media page and bump up. If you are in a jurisdiction that has hate crimes, I think you could bump up whatever assault or, God forbid, murder occurred, you could bump that up to a hate crime because of that post. But you couldn't prosecute them for making the post. Not if they didn't do anything about it. That's crazy. Okay. But I get it. I mean, I get it. It's just lynching seems so... I don't know. Does that I mean, fighting it's... words thing ever get held up? Yeah. Like I mean, it courts? is. It okay. is yeah, it, it does. But there, it has. To, it's tied to the physical violence. It's tied yeah. to the criminal act, not solely mm, okay. the speech. Right, right. Like, yeah. Right. So it's like, okay, I'm saying, I'm saying this to you to provoke a fight. That's fighting right. words. Yeah, and even that's hard. Like as we've seen from the Capitol, even that is really hard to get pinned because they still haven't been able to say well, we'll that the see. president of we'll the United see. It's States. Working, it's working its way through the courts. Yeah, yeah but it's also being treated because he's the, t- treated differently because he's the president, you know? Yeah. And, and and we really hate to hold power accountable in this country. So yeah. it's, it's that doesn't mean that the doctrine is doesn't exist. It, it means that it's selectively applied. Right, right. That's a good way to put it. Yeah. Okay. And so what, on your view, are the problems with or, or the benefits with excluding hate speech from First Amendment protection. So how do you think about that? Well, you know, I think I see it a little bit differently now that I'm, you know, now that I've seen the effects of, uh, you know, the right wing media apparatus and, and the damage mm. that they're doing to the country. So, you know, I'm with everybody else who uh, cares about freedom and, and inclusivity Um and like, how do we solve this? But mm-hmm. including hate speech in the First Amendment, uh, excluding, I'm sorry, excluding hate speech from First Amendment protection has problems. I mean, because it's not, because you're going to be looking at what specifically is said every single time, what does that mean? You means you're going before a judge who's going to have to decide whether specific words are hate speech or not. And it's frankly just not a good idea to give judges this power. And right. some judges, they don't even want it. They're going to say, you know, like, well, I, that's not my, you know, that's, 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 that's too broad. That's not my, that's not my place to do that. And mm-hmm. other judges, I think, you know, especially these, these right wing judges um, that Trump has installed in this, I, you know, I think they might be very happy to, um, you know, make some judgments against, say, Black Lives Matter protesters, mm-hmm. not, of course, you know, conservative or right-wing speech. You know, I think you could see partisan um, decisions come down. And ultimately- Well, we've seen this happen, right, in the states that are passing those laws that are criminalizing disrespectful behavior toward cops. I think it's Kentucky, maybe. Yeah. So you're actually seeing this happen right now. And it's not happening for the social good. It's happening. It's regressive, right? It's protecting cops over the people that cops attack. (laughs) Right, right, and they, and so there, th- those laws will undoubtedly be challenged in the courts, and if they come up against, uh, you know, authoritarian judges who want to protect powerful uh, authoritarian tactics over the community, then they may find that speech, you know, they may they may exclude that speech. Um, right, right. So, you know, I, I think a good example of like just how ugly speech that's protective is, is this um, Snyder versus Phelps Supreme Court case from 2001 about the Westboro Baptist Church. Now, 2011, if you're not, right? 2011, yes. Now, if yeah. you're not familiar with Westboro Baptist Church, they're heinous. They're basically, they're basically just a, a totally dysfunctional family um, mm-hmm. that calls itself a church. Um, and for like 20 years, this group has been picketing military funerals to express their belief that God hates the U.S. because of the U.S.'s tolerance for homosexuality. So the leader is Fred Phelps. And yeah, he basically only leads his own poor indoctrinated relatives. 
Mm. So they traveled across state lines to Maryland, which is why this ended up being a federal case. And they picketed about a thousand feet from this church where they were having a military funeral. They were on public property. It was a silent protest. They complied with local law enforcement. They held up signs for 30 minutes that read, thank God for dead soldiers, fags doom nations, priests rape boys, and you're going to hell. Jesus. So the, the so which is just disgusting, right? This, this poor dead soldier had nothing to do with anything in his family. You know, they don't really deserve to be harassed by some random, weird, dysfunctional family that calls itself a church. So the soldier's dad sued for intentional infliction of emotional distress. And the, the jury awarded him millions in damages because they're like, screw this church. But then the Fourth Circuit, they reversed the conviction, saying that the First Amendment shields this church from civil liability because the statements were about matters of public concern. They were not provably false, and they were expressed solely through hyperbolic rhetoric. Weird. So, yeah, yeah. So it was like, you know, I think had they shouted, or, you know, if they, but they were silent. They just held up these, mm. these offensive signs. I mean, it really was straight speech and as far as because it was just signs. And so, you know, they, they said, you know, that they, they got rid of the damages on that. Now, this speech, even though it's protected, is subject to reasonable time, place, or manner restrictions. And I think that's what you see when they say, okay, well, they were on public property. They were, uh, they only were 30 minutes. They, uh, you know, complied with local law enforcement. So they, they did make their speech, but it was, you know, limited in their protest. You know, they mm -hmm. didn't intrude upon um, the funeral other than that. Like the father didn't actually even see the signs until he watched the news later that night. Oh, wow. Yeah. So he saw the news and, and, and then was like offended, you know, as one would be, as one normally would be. So, you know, this case kind of stands for the proposition that we as a nation have chosen to protect even hurtful speech when it's on public mm. issues so that to ensure that the public debate is not stifled. Yeah. And I mean, Westboro Church is a really good example because it's one of those things that <laughs> I think your first instinct is to want to call it hate speech, right? Like I want the law to make this go away. But I also have to remember that um, – even though the law does not, in fact, equally apply to everyone, it certainly pretends as if it does. And so any law you want to make would apply to everyone. So you can only imagine what would happen if the hate speech were enforceable and Black Lives Matter protests happened, because it's easy to like see that the Westboro Baptist Church is injurious, but what if you flip it and like cops, and cops have said this, right, that the Black Lives Matter protests and the, and the defund the police are like creating a hostile environment for police and it's making them unsafe. And so while I can understand wanting the law to step in and shut down some of these like vile opinions, I also recognize that if hate speech were regulated, it would be used against minoritized people and opinions about like trans rights and anti-black <laughs> racism. I think probably more often given the current situation in the courts than it would against like homophobic speech or racist speech. A hundred percent. The police yeah. are the ones who are, are tasked with uh, regulating and making sure that the time, place and manage, manner restrictions apply so that you are able to have that, you know, all groups are able to get their speech out on public matters, uh, right. you know, in a reasonable way. So Black Lives Matter, they are criticizing the police. If the police could if the police could shut that down. Yeah, they would. Sure. Right. right. Like, the, I mean, because it's a direct criticism of them. So, yeah, I think you would see I think that would be the first thing we would see in, in yeah. our climate. Absolutely. That you'd see shut down. And you can see an example of that happening on the flip side in this uh, Oscar nominated uh, short documentary called Don't Split. It's about the Hong Kong pro-democracy um protests. And uh, we'll right, include yeah. the YouTube link. You can stream it for free. Um in our show notes. And I really encourage you to watch it. It's not that long. And it's an amazing example of what happens when an authoritarian government, in this case, China, wants to stifle pro-democracy speech and to criminalize it. What's the GOP? They are budding authoritarians and they're enacting all of these anti-democratic uh, voter suppression attempts. And they 
there was, you know, an attempt to overthrow the government and propagate all this propaganda of the big lie, you know, that Trump actually won just to undercut democracy. We have 361 voter suppression bills currently being pushed by Republicans in state legislatures. So what do you think that they're going to do to speech that they don't like if they get back in power? Right. So what's so... Yeah, so I get it. I mean, I think this is like a hard thing to try to explain to people because your your emotional self wants someone to step in. And this this is um, from States of Injury by Wendy Brown, this idea that like part of the trap is getting minoritized people to appeal to the state to protect them because they f- they feel hurt. It's It's a trap because even if the law steps in and decides to protect you, which is rare, they're protecting you. They're never going to protect you because of your feelings, because feelings are subjective, and you can't you can't make rules based on people's feelings. No matter how much I want people who are hurting from like racism <laughs> to feel better, but it does raise the question: if you can't go to the law and demand hate speech because hate speech isn't a thing, how do you get social change? Well, the the you know what. The First Amendment propagates is the counter to hate speech is more speech, different Mm. speech. So Mm -hmm. they, you you know, there's somebody on campus has a, you know, anti-trans rally set up, you know, set up a pro-trans, pro-LGBTQ educational, you know, forums, you know, and and so it's that's supposed to be the way it works. You know, it it Mm. expands the marketplace of ideas yeah and that's what it's supposed that's supposed to be the antidote for hate speech and that does require vigilance and action you know on all sides and and it's really easy to just be like oh can they just shut up and go away this is terrible um Mm -hmm. you know but that's again as we've said before that's a really dangerous uh road to go down to stifle speech you know, you could, you could, ag- as part of it, you could agitate for that type of change in the First Amendment law. You have a right to do that. You could argue that the law should be changed to exclude hate speech. But considering that it's undefined, you're going to need to define, well, what is hate speech? And, right. you know, what what laws are going to be passed that the the judges would have to apply this new definition of hate speech? And... You know, I think that you're going to need to explain exactly what viewpoints the government is going to be allowed to suppress and what go- mm-hmm. viewpoints are going to be protected and how judges and juries and prosecutors are supposed to distinguish between the groups. Right. So it's 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 not just like, oh, ban, ha- ban hate speech. No, you, there's a, if you want to advocate for that, you, there's a lot more work to do to make right. an argument that isn't going to come back and bite all of us. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, to me, so it's like thinking about this rhetorically, the problem with continuing, I think at a certain point, you just have to recognize that we get trapped in this binary, right? Free speech, hate speech, free speech, hate speech. So one side says, oh, this is hate speech. And the other side is like, no, it's free speech. And then it flips and it flips back. And it's essentially like the more the more um the the broader version of the cancel culture argument oh you want to cancel me for this but then i want to cancel you for this and i want to cancel you canceling me and i'm going to cancel you canceling canceling me and so you get stuck in this conversation that really makes up every makes everybody kind of entrenched and also it, it winds up making people who advocate for hate speech look silly um because obviously the other side is they're they're waiting for it right the people who are claiming free speech for saying offensive things and and hateful language are waiting for you to call it hate speech so they can be like oh not a real thing because it kind of shows how to sort of out out of touch you are and um i think it strengthens their position in some ways and so i'll give you like a quick example from my campus that's later that's really really recent because we're going to talk about this thing called school sponsored speech because right now i have my students really advocating for hate speech and i just keep telling them like you're not going to get anywhere with this argument and also i don't know that you even want the argument that you think that you want so one of the things we've been talking about is what other terms have you got for counter speech because counter speech co- that calls things hate speech is basically just trapping you in a losing position right so i put a post on my facebook page and asked some other rhetoric communication scholars like my hive mind 
what, you know, what do you do? What are some ways out of this binary of hate speech, free speech? And so they gave me some options. Um, they suggested, you know, just like it's it's symbolic. You can call it racism. You can call it symbolic racism or, or um, symbolic transphobia, aversive transphobia, implicit racism, implicit transphobia, implicit sexism, um, animus. So that's a good word like racial animus, transphobic animus, sexist animus. Uh, symbolic violence. I think that's a really good one. Notice how the, the word hate has been taken out of it. It's symbolic violence. And it also takes the burden away from the person being offended to the person doing the act. So when you say, oh, Mary, you have hurt me, it, it really it just isn't the way our law works. So instead, you have to be like, oh, Mary, you've committed symbolic violence, right? Because it really needs to be an action that you've taken, not an effect that I, I feel. And this idea of like, oh, we're going to give you emotional damages. I mean, as we've seen, it does happen, but it has to be very targeted at a specific group. It can't just be like, in general, you're part of a group that has been hurt through symbolic communication. It just doesn't get you anywhere. And then uh, in the case of some of the things that have been happening with people painting over symbols or people taking things down because they don't like the message, uh, erasure, so sexist erasure, transphobic erasure. And the point isn't like to pick any one of these. The point is that when you're willing to agree that the binary isn't working and counter speech is the only thing we have, then you start getting creative about inventing language to create arguments that short circuit these free speech logics from the opposition. It's like, yeah, sure, it's free speech. That's not the point. You're also a racist. And I, I keep trying to bring the students back to that argument because you're going to lose in a free speech, hate speech debate, but you can absolutely give in and say, yeah, you know what? I get it that the Constitution protects your right. You're still saying racist, violent shit. And like, try to pull people into that debate because that's the one you can win. And then one thing I've heard a lot is hateful speech because it's not hate speech, but it's close, right? And it gets at the fact you're being hateful. But to me, it's too close. It's too it's too easy for you to say hateful speech and someone else to say, oh, you said hate speech. And you're like, no, I didn't. So I just try to stay away from the word hate entirely. Because even though I agree, most of this hate speech that's not hate speech is hateful speech. Rhetorically, they seem too similar. And the other one, which is also suggested by some really famous critical theorists, uh, Judith Butler and Wendy Brown again, is injurious speech. And they're writing about legal theory, but it's it's an interesting term. It's got some ground. But the same thing, it's like we it's, it's another way of gauging the effects of speech by how hurt or injured the person on the receiving end is. And I think that's a losing battle because whether or not you feel injured is a subjective experience, right? Because it's just as likely that somebody hops up and is like, well, I'm a black person and I wasn't hurt by this or I'm an Asian American and this didn't offend me. And then the whole argument falls apart. So- it's really important that you keep the focus on the behavior, that you stay out of the free speech, hate speech binary, and that you try to focus on why the behavior is bad for society, not because it injures people, but because it perpetuates really shitty ideologies, right? And so you see this all the time with cancel culture. People go out and they're like, well, I was offended by this. And then the far right usually is like, well, who could get offended over drawings in a Dr. Seuss book? But then the far right comes back and is really hurt by uh, Lil Nas X's video. And then everybody's like, well, how could you even be hurt by this? <laughs> you see, it's like, it's just a trap that really gets people talking around each other in circles. So I don't use hate speech or injurious speech or hateful speech, but I do try to make use of different terms from the earlier list and make the claim, and I think this is really important, that it's I, I get that your speech is free. I'm not debating that, but I am saying it's racist, homophobic, whatever. And you can use modifiers um, like symbolic racism. I don't want to minimize the effects. Like racism is racism is racism. But the problem is that when you come at somebody and call something racist, when they, I don't know, put up an American flag over a Black Lives Matter sign, it's just too easy for them to be like, what's racist about America? So if you try to nuance it with symbolic racism or like I said, like symbolic violence, that can be helpful because it gets the conversation headed in a different direction. So that's kind of where I'm at rhetorically with this stuff, especially like having to talk a lot to people who want to agitate for hate speech about what their options are. So Mary, what do you think? Well, I mean, uh, listening to things in my, with my legal brain, there's, you know, the viol symbolic violence, I think, well, it's interesting. Um, kind of gets into that fighting words and it's like when you're when you're really dealing with speech like that isn't that's just offensive it's not at, that's not actually trying to ins, you know hmm. you know instigate a crime the, violent so to me violence is like I, I don't think that's the best term what I what I really okay. liked what you said though was erasure 
And I think mm-hmm. that reframing everything around erasure is the most accurate description of what's going on. And we never talk about it, but that's really what they're trying to do. They're trying to erase trans people. I don't want to deal with trans people. I don't want them to exist. I don't want them to get health care. Let's just erase them. They can go yeah, to the bathroom. I don't want them in the military. I don't want yeah. them in the military. I don't want to, I want to, I don't want to think about them. I don't even want to look at them. Mm-hmm. You know, I want to, what, what's segregation? I want to erase these people from my world. I want to have a little right. bubble where people that aren't like me don't exist. And I, ha- I don't have to even know anything about them. That people get really uncomfortable. Those kind of people get really uncomfortable just with being exposed to people that they haven't been exposed to. And and maybe that's a completely normal human, probably is a very normal human reaction. But what isn't, what what we want to evolve beyond is the idea that then that gives you the, your discomfort gives you the right to then erase something that makes you uncomfortable or that you feel uncomfortable about. They're not making you uncomfortable. You feel uncomfortable right. because something's different. So I, I think erasure right, right. from is, is like, uh, that's where the, you know, reframing everything. I really think that that um, is, is good. And I, I, I'm going to think about that, you know, you know, using awesome terms um, with that. So, all right. So we are, you know, as we were, as I've kind of been talking about throughout this, we're, we have this problem now, you know, yes, free speech, you know, let's not exclude hate speech, but we've got new challenges from 2001 and from, you know, earlier on when all these main points of, of law were coming down. We have new challenges with the proliferation and popularity of propaganda coming from the white right wing media. Uh, the white the, the, the white wing media. <laughs> Whoa, can you believe that was so <laughs> not, not wrong. I know. I know. That just came ooh, okay. Well, anyway, you could see where where I how I feel about it. So you have the Mercers and we, we talk a lot about the Cokes, but you know, I don't think we talk enough about the Mercers. It's certainly an area I, I think I need to delve into more but they're really the they're really the ones behind fox and and all this right wing propaganda i mean they're the ones you know getting the message out to everybody the fox news onn newsmax all the talk radio shows podcasts facebook the internet so it's just pumping out so much uh hate speech really i mean that's that's you know hateful speech or, you know they're they're doing that's their that's their agenda and, well, and misinformation right I think that and that's a totally different sure. category <laughs> sometimes it's just straight up lies yes absolutely and and before before 1988 we had the thing called the fairness doctrine and it's funny because I did a quick Google search of this when I was preparing for it and you, when you Google search the fairness doctrine you get like a couple articles that are like historical discussions. And then there's these negative opinion pieces about how unfair it is, how awful and terrible the fairness doctrine is. And it was funny. Those were done by the Heritage Foundation and the Cato Mm -hmm. Institute, which if you will recall, are Coke. This is Coke. So that was a big push um, by by Coke and his ilk uh, to get rid of the fairness doctrine. It had been adopted in 1949. Um, It provided that stations, you know, radio or television had to provide balanced coverage of all controversial issues of public importance. So it's different from the equal time doctrine, which was something, you know, about strict equality for, um, for, you know, political candidates and stuff. Um, This was, this was about covering all sides of uh, issues of political importance in talk programs and in news coverage. So once they got rid of that, then boom, Rush Limbaugh yeah. comes out, you know, with his right wing. Yeah. And so they didn't have to, he never had to bring another side of the story. He could just pump out his one sided view. Mm-hmm. And, and call it news, which is, that's the problem, right? Because Fox isn't news. And there was that lawsuit a couple of years ago that failed to make Fox drop the word news from its title. Same thing with Newsmax. I mean, I read Newsmax. I've actually contributed my opinion to Newsmax. They always change what I said or or cherry pick quotes precisely because they're it's a propaganda machine. It's not news. 
Right. And it's gotten even worse because, uh, so you have the, you know, the Reagan era, they, Reagan, they eliminated the, uh, the fairness doctrine. Then Trump comes in and he loosened the ownership restrictions on stations, which means that this group, the Sinclair Broadcast Group, this conservative group has been buying up local, uh, television stations all over the country and they push out the exact same viewpoint that is, that is not, fair. It's not balanced. It doesn't provide um, information on both sides of controversial public issues. So they they own all of the ABCs, by the way. And it took me a while to realize this because I used to contribute to the ABC seven local channels until I realized they were owned by Sinclair Broadcast Group. Yeah. So it's, it's important, you know, and and they still have your, your local anchors that you've probably trusted forever that are now forced to read the same canned uh, material that's mm-hmm. pumped out from Sinclair across all of their stations nationwide. Yeah, or so, they're fired like they have been in three counties near us, and then all the news is just repeated news from whatever major place will just buy the hook, line, and sinker argument, and then it's just distributed as if it's local, but it isn't. Right. 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 So your local paper is very often just repeat news that's been produced in a city near you by the Sinclair Broadcast Group. It's not a local reporter that's like embedded in the community. So this is a big problem, you know, yeah. that that we we have to address and it, I don't know that I have all the answers but it's important that we think about how we get more balanced coverage because people are just listening to whatever you can you can say MSNBC too MSNBC is too one sided I don't know that I agree mm-hmm. with that but you can make that argument that mm-hmm. everybody would benefit from more uh balanced coverage for sure all right, let's hit our last uh, our last big topic, which is school sponsored speech. Mm. Now, this is a uh, this is an instance where the First Amendment protection is a little bit different in the context of school sponsored speech, and we're talking about public universities. Um, you know, they're they're you know government institutions. So. There's a test to establish whether or not um, First Amendment protection applies, and that is whether an action restricting a a plaintiff or school-sponsored speech is reasonably related to the school's legitimate pedagogical educational interests in the test for determining whether the speech is protected by the First Amendment. So, you know, for instance, you as a teacher do not have to allow a student to spew racist speech in class, uh, you know, and having it, you know, get disrupting other students and getting them upset. You don't have to allow that. You can control uh, that speech and say that's not acceptable. You can limit that as a teacher, you know, because that's going against having a uh, an environment, you know, that is conducive to the learning for all students. So, you know, and Lee, jump in any time on this, because this is really your you're on the front lines of this. Well, it kind of ties everything together, because in theory, free speech has limitations. It has academic limitations. So when people say academic free speech, which I get I hear people say all the time, it's actually a more limited form. It's also not a thing, right? It isn't it isn't a thing. It's a it's a thing that was made up by different universities in the 60s, primarily for anti-war agitators. But now it's invoked by conservatives to say like, oh, I can teach um, that, you know, like evolution isn't real because I have academic free speech. And it's it's no academic free speech restricts your speech to the context of you teaching your what you, what you have learned from research. So, for example, if you have research that finds um, that something that's been held true is not true, and you conducted the research, you're allowed to teach that because it's what you, as an academic, have learned. But instead, it's just becoming this catch-all for academics who want to spew conservative nonsense, even though they have conducted no research on it. They're just saying what they think is true. But it's not again recognized. It's it's a term that people have made up, almost like hate speech. But school-sponsored speech is an actual thing. And it limits it limits what is considered free speech because the interests of free speech may come up against the interests of educating. Because your free speech also entitles you to say lies and spread hatred and create hostile learning environments. And the school has to balance those needs against the needs of you know, what they're trying to accomplish. And so this just happened for campus because there was a student who was in the school of ed 
um, saying all of this stuff on their Instagram about how they don't respect pronouns and a man is a man and a woman is a woman and all this stuff. Some stuff about like slavery being entrepreneurship. I mean, just a bunch of stuff that the, that the students said was their conservative ideology. But if you agree to that, then you have a really weird sense of what a conservative is. And we talk, and actually, there's an episode on May It Displeased the Court about this word conservative. So if you haven't listened to that, you should check that out. So the conservative ideology, I disagree. Uh, it's a, it's just, it's just lies. It's just, it's just nonsense that's being called conservative. But the school of education suspended the student from field work, which is like their student teaching. Because, you know, you can't send somebody like that into a K-12 classroom because obviously they can't keep their opinions in check in order to provide an educational environment. So all the school said was like, you got to stop saying stuff like this in public. Um, you have to maybe take some training so that we know you're not going to go in and dead name a trans student. And like, these are the laws of New York State and this is what it requires to be a teacher. So then the student goes on their Instagram, and I think this part is very important, and lies and said they were kicked out of the school. So they misrepresented themselves. So, you know, you always want to watch this free speech stuff because free speech is one thing, but being a liar is another thing. So they lied. And then, of course, immediately what happened is the right wing pro free speech, pro family organizations that are very well dark money funded swooped in to lawyer the student up against the school. And that's where the marketplace of ideas is such a lie because yes, in a marketplace of ideas, I'd be all for it. But when you've got major, big conservative, dark money backing you, I wouldn't even say conservative, right? Right wing, anti-democratic money backing you. That's no longer a marketplace of ideas because it's no longer equal access. And so in this particular case, it was a group called the society for the defense of tradition, family, and property. Um, and they described themselves as a group that was created to counter liberal, socialist, and communist trends of the times and proudly affirm the positive values of tradition, family, and private property. So they circulate a petition to get this student reinstated, quote unquote, in school, even though, again, student was never removed from school, just told they can't go into a classroom to do their field work, which, you know, their student teaching, which seemed pretty legitimate to me. Um, but the petition required uh, accumulated 20,000 signatures. It described itself as a peaceful protest and argues that the student's original suspension, which again was not a real suspension, um, sounded, quote, like something right out of a communist gulag, not the USA, and also said, quote, what happened, as in the, the suspension from school, which never really happened, quote, is not merely an attack on truth or on free speech. It is an attack on reality itself, right? So again, um, disconfirming the idea that someone can be trans or non-binary or ask for they pronouns or whatever. And I use they pronouns, by the way. So so this all happens. But the point I want to make is that this wasn't one student's free speech being being censored by the school. This was a school-sponsored decision about what their educational mission is versus a student. The student then lied and then immediately was so insulated by right-wing anti-democratic money to protect them that now they've been reinstated in school and are doing other things now like painting USA flags over Black Lives Matter protest. And you can see how it isn't the student having a certain amount of speech and then accepting the consequences and then the marketplace of ideas having its way. It's really, really rigged against honestly, in favor of the students. So this idea that like liberal opinions are ruling on college campuses and conservatives are being oppressed. I mean, looking at this case study, I would argue quite the opposite. Well, I, you know, this pivot to dark money, I think is uh, on campuses is really important to yeah. highlight because there's this group called Speech First Incorporated, and their plan is to flood the courts with lawsuits. And yeah. they have uh, there's they they've had suits in the Fifth Circuit, Sixth Circuit, and Seventh Circuit, and they uh, they call themselves grassroot a grassroots civil rights watchdog, uh, which is not true. Uh, we'll get more on that in a second. So this group they filed a lawsuit against uh, the University of Michigan. Um, challenging their disciplinary rules and procedures, which prohibited harassment, bullying, and bias-related conduct. And also they had a, uh, they had a panel, you know, that would look at the situation. This panel was purely educa an educational resource. There was no disciplinary authority, but they, right. uh, you know, they wanted to strike all of that down, saying that that even existing chilled the speech of conservatives, you know, who wanted to speak out, I guess, who wanted to just harass and bully people. Right. Um, 
so that was the Sixth Circuit case of uh, free speech versus Schlissel. And that also, you know, again, Seventh Circuit, Fifth Circuit. So they're they're out there, you know, trying to find these students to, you know, file cases against. And this is we've, you know, may it displease the court. We've talked about this. This this is this is a, a very much the conservative agenda, the Koch agenda to use the courts as a sword and to tee up cases uh, to you know, give the courts the opportunity to uh, rule in the way that they want to limiting, uh, you know, limiting speech and, and, and protections for, you know, LGBTQ people, trans people, et cetera, et cetera. Well, yeah. And I think it's so hilarious that they're like, oh, we fight for civil liberties. It's like, really? Because I see you people on campus all the time. I see your flyers. I see you trying to start groups. I mean, now this student who's been unfairly kicked out of school, which again, it never happened, is starting a chapter and recruiting. I never see him show up for any civil liberties that aren't directly in service of the far right agenda. Like it'd be one thing if they showed up anytime civil liberties were under threat like the ACLU does, but they don't. They show up only when very specific interests are threatened and they're always interests that serve corporations, right? Well, I find it really obnoxious that the in these court cases, they describe this speech first incorporated as this, you know, claiming to be the civil rights watchdog. It is a professional astroturfing campaign. The board yeah. are former Bush administration lawyers. They are an, an affiliates of the Koch family. Okay. Yeah. They, that's, they are they they started in 2018. They seem to have been created purely for the purpose of instigating campus culture wars. Yeah. And uh, you know, it's their president Nicole Nelly or Neely admitted that there was no students involved in founding the group. Right. There's a right. five dollar lifetime membership due, and they have to pay the student has to pay that in order for them to take the student's case to court. Five bucks. Um, but that is a, quote, negligible part of the funding, which the funding mainly comes from undisclosed backers, which, of course, we know means dark money. And we also know means Coke money yeah. and fossil fuel money. Right. Pro fossil, fossil fuel, fuel money. Fossil mm -hmm. fuel money. Their board of directors include a former head of Coke back trust, conservative attorneys from Coke funded programs. Uh, you know, the board s comes from George Mason University, which we've just talked about extensively on May It Displeased the Court. Jay's George Mason University has basically been co-opted by the Cokes who have mm -hmm. given them, you know, influence over academic appointments in departments that they fund. Uh, hello, no academic freedom there. Um, hmm. So that's who is pushing these these lawsuits, you know, across the country, because this is this is part of their agenda. And you know, it's important to watch, watch what the Cokes are doing, you know, it's, and it's tough because there is, there is no counter on the left funded to, to, to no, there's really not. I mean, this is important to point out that everyone, I mean, I get that there's a perception that, that university are these, are these liberal indoctrination machines. I mean, I understand that that's the impression, but if you really look at the reality on the ground, even if, the administration, even if the faculty of a college and the student population skew liberal, right? So my campus, even though we're in a very, very conservative area, right? We were, we elected Trump in my, in that county where my school is. I would guess you're probably 70, 30, 65, 35, maybe in terms of ideology, but it's not an even representation because the money on the conservative far right side and watch, I mean, this is like the third time this has happened in the last four years. And I've never seen anybody on the left like some big money organizations swoop in to, to protect up. I mean, ever, right? It's all, it's, it's, we are the only ones legitimately participating in the marketplace of ideas. So I get it that you've been sold this line of bullshit that conservatives are under attack on campus. And yes, I agree. Conservatives do hold the minority opinion. If you just look at like individual human beings, but you're not thinking about the money that's coming in to bolster support for the far right. And also like, your opinion being in the minority is a sign that you have the wrong opinion in the marketplace of ideas. So don't come telling me that it's the left oppressing you. And that's why your opinions aren't being heard. You're just not popular anymore. Like the rest of the world is catching on. They're supporting trans rights. They're supporting Black Lives Matter. And it's only conservative money that's even keeping the opposition alive in a lot of ways. If it well, weren't for it conservative money and campaign finance reform going out the window and Citizens United, this shit would be so... <laughs> On its way out, you know what I mean? 
But it's not conservative money in the broad sense. It's it's a handful. Wait, it's a handful yeah, of a few activist billionaires. Yes, it's know. it's it's far right, anti democratic, pro corporate, pro fossil fuels money. Yeah, let's be. Right. Yeah, that's right, Mary. It's not conservative. I, I I use a shorthand that is not accurate. Right. All right. So, what does the left need? to do? You know, what do they need to do? They need to appreciate that excluding hate speech from the First Amendment means that it can be expressed and that it's a dangerous proposition, especially when we're facing a huge increase in Trump appointed right wing judges. Frankly, excluding hate speech is the same tactic that the Republicans are using by passing bills to suppress the right to vote. Instead Mm -hmm. of trying to win over voters, the Republicans are trying to adopt policies or trying to adopt policies that the majority of people support, Republicans are just working to suppress the power of those who disagree with them by suppressing their ability to vote. This is Mm -hmm. lazy and authoritarian. The left, we want to be the opposite of that approach. We need to do the hard work of making the arguments against offensive, hateful speech, erasure of different groups, and Mm -hmm. engage in the debate as much and as passionately as the right is engaging. We don't have Coke money. That is very clear. So we can't create and fund faux grassroots movements. Not that we want to anyway, but. Yeah. Yeah. And um, we also have the more popular argument. I mean, you you can see that even though there has been a conservative backlash that is mostly fueled by far right propaganda, generally speaking, the left has the more popular argument. And you know, if there's one thing I think that being that not being bound by like old traditions and outdated categories gets you right, not being like f- so fearful of of the new and so clingy to the past that never existed, it's the ability to think critically and creatively about new identity positions, about new strategies of argument, about new language. So the good news is that if anyone can strategize counter speech, it's the left, and we have the numbers. Mm-hmm. So we have the bigger group of people. I mean, that's the whole deal with Coke and his people is their positions are not popular. So they're nope. having to do all these stealth things to get around their unpopularity. So we have to use our voices collectively and consistently so that to, to defend inclusivity without trying to exclude offensive speech. Yep. And I mean, th- this is like, they call this the radical commitment to inclusivity, right? So if you are radically committed to inclusivity, then everybody gets to be included, even opinions you hate. And that's a, I, I get it. Like, that's a super hard position to take, but I do think it's the only winning position. So, you know, Mary, it's always great to get a chance to connect with you um, over on the West Coast. You are, you are truly the great champion of the left. <laughs> So I love it. And listeners, if this is your first time hearing Mary, definitely check out the podcast, May It Displease the Court. It's linked in the show notes. And uh, you'll hear a little bit of me. And I'm really excited for what you've got planned for season two. Yes. And if you are listening to this episode and you haven't checked out Rhetorically Speaking, definitely go do that. It will be linked as well. All right. Well, thanks uh, to all the freedom fighters out there. And I guess mask up and stay safe. Become a little less cliche with each new episode of Rhetorically Speaking dropping every Tuesday. Be sure to hit subscribe and leave a review on whatever app you use to listen. Don't be a digital freeloader. You're better than that.